Okay, we are now about to start the international contest. One more reminder, if you use this gadget after the table topic contest, I will remind you to please cut it off or to vibrate. I want to make sure I'm doing the same. Hey, Mom. Okay. <laughs> Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure all doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering a room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it's determined that all ballots have been collected. Now, I would like to introduce the order of the International Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Asa Ausley. Asa Ausley, contestant number one. Contestant number two, Charlene Reinhardt. Charlene Reinhardt, contestant number two. Contestant number three, Kat Hennington. Kat Hennington, contestant number three. Contestant number four, Marlene Berger. Marlene Berger, contestant number four. Contestant number five, Amy Lee Sagami. Amy Lee Sagami, contestant number five. Last but not least, contestant number six, Steve Few. T. Few, contestant number six. We will proceed with the international speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between contestants. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time <coughs> they need to complete their ballot. Let the contest begin. Yay. Are you ready for the next comedian? Oh, that's the wrong contest. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Contestant number one, Asa Ausley. I knew I could. I knew I could. Asa Ausley. speech contest. I spoke about the negative legacies in my community and how it impacted underserved youth. I sang to those youth an excerpt of the motivational song, I Know I Can. And it went, I know I can be what I want to be. If I work hard at it, I'll be where I want to be, be, be. But while I was singing, I know I can to those youth, I was also singing to myself of my own dreams and aspirations and didn't even know it. This is my story. And while you're listening, I want you to ponder, what's your story? What are your dreams and aspirations? And what is your progress in achieving them? I know I can. I knew I could. I used to work for Kraft Foods. I secured a summer internship as my final degree requirement to receive my bachelor's in accounting. Now I chose accounting because it was safe. I knew opportunities for jobs would always be plenty. But in contrast, I'm a people person, a communicator. I'm passionate about giving back, helping others, and nothing about sitting behind a desk crunching numbers will fulfill my passion. But still, I stayed. 
After that summer, I secured a full-time position with Kraft and their accounting department, where I remained for five years. But my ultimate goal is to start my own nonprofit organization, where community volunteers would get together to create access and exposure to career exploration and entrepreneurship to underserved youth. These youth are not aware of the plethora of career opportunities that lies at their fingertips. So they don't see themselves reaching a certain level of success beyond the superficial standards portrayed by the media and society every day. They only choose jobs based on what they see or hear, but not careers based on their passions or areas of interest. So in order for me to create and lead a sustainable nonprofit, I wanted to first gain the academic knowledge learning theory of what it takes to be successful. So while at Crafts, I pursued my Master's of Nonprofit Management, in which I completed. But it wasn't enough. I then wanted to gain the hands-on knowledge of the nonprofit sector. So I volunteered countless hours at several nonprofits carrying out the service projects that they had planned. That they had planned. It just wasn't enough. And on top of that, I began to hate my job at Kraft. And then it hit me. I was a product of the same problem I wanted to eliminate. I had only chosen accounting because I was always good in math and because I took an accounting course in high school and because my parents wouldn't let me major in theater. <laughs> Not because I foreseen a long-term career. I needed to be in the trenches creating, planning, implementing my own ideas to fruition. But in order to do that, I would have to do the unthinkable, the unimaginable. I would have to leave my job for five years. But I knew that I had to be the change that I wanted to see. The time was right now for me to be that catalyst for change. So I challenged my courage and I quit my job at Kraft to pursue my passion in the nonprofit sector. Now, experience is just like credit. You have to have some to get some. <laughs> so with no prior nonprofit work experience, I had to incorporate unconventional methods. So for one year, I worked at two nonprofits for free, <laughs> which has actually thus been the best experiences of my life so far. I also became a certified grant writer because the number one aspect of a sustainable nonprofit is funding. <laughs> but you know, people call me crazy. You gave up how much money to work for free? But my passion and inspiration to be a resource to my community while paving the way for my successors trumps any amount of money. Besides, this hard work and humble beginnings it develops character, ambition, drive that those with a silver spoon can only hope to gain. I'm still not where I want to be. Oh, but I'm still in stride of finishing this race. You see, there are two races in life. The race to life and the race in life. The race to life is all about speed. Think biological. At conception, in order to win the race, you had to beat great odds because there were a million other little contenders to be, well, you. But you made it. Everybody in this room is special. Everybody that you know, everybody in this world, no matter race or gender, is special because you made it. You won the race to life. Now the race in life has nothing to do with speed. On the road to achieving your goals, there will be obstacles. You got friends, relatives, society, fear, doubt. Now you can choose to try to avoid those obstacles by taking shortcuts, but you run the risk of going off course. So you got to face your obstacles head on. See, the thing about this race in life, it doesn't matter where or how you start or the stops you make along the way. What matters is that you end. It's finishing the race that matters. This race in life is about resilience, hard work, strength, endurance. So I challenge you today and every day of your life to be inspired to finish your race, to tell your story. No matter the obstacles, the trials, the setbacks, challenge your courage. 
Pursue your passion to be the change that you want to see. Believe in yourself. Know that you can. I knew I could. So today, I'll help you make that very first step in declaring that you know you can. So clap and repeat after me. I know I can, I know I can. be what I want to be. be, what I wanna be. If I work hard at it, if I work hard at it, I'll be where I want to be. I'll be where I want to be. Be, be, be. 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 <laughs> Contestant number two, Charlene Reinhardt, is a thin line between love and hate. It's a thin line between love and hate, Charlene Reinhardt. that they had, 
even though I wasn't a new student, but I wanted to visualize success. I learned in Toastmasters that if you wanted to be a success, you have to first see it and act like it. So I went to Harvard. Well, there was this one day that I went to Harvard, and like you ask all Ivy League institutions, you want to have the business card so that you can connect with them later. Oh, well, they told me, you can go to our website and find all the information online. Nobody has ever rejected me in that manner. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. My friends told me that I should explore my other options because I was pretty devastated. So I looked at Souders in New York, Cornell. I went to California and Stanford was very attractive. Then I went to North Carolina. That's where I met Mr. Duke. All right. <laughs> Someone recommended that I stay in Illinois because all the best men are here. Northwestern, University of Chicago, but I wanted to explore my options. Now those schools were all impressive, but none compared to Harvard until I went on Match.com. <laughs> How many of you have ever used Match.com? I'm sure it's more than two people. <laughs> no, no, I'm about to tell you what happens on Match.com. There's a process that we go through in order to find out who our true mate is. But in order to find your true mate, you must first find out who you are. There's a self-assessment called TAGS. Identify your talents, abilities, gifts, and skills. Because once you do that, Match.com will give you the results of your perfect mate. Well, I found my perfect mate. University of Michigan, Ross School of Business. Now Ross, he was everything I could want in a man. He gave me the three things that all women want. Money, attention, and food. <laughs> I was in love. I couldn't imagine life without Ross. I knew that I would get married and go meet Ross in September of 2015. I applied, he immediately took me out on a date, and I knew he fell in love with me. Who wouldn't fall in love with me on the first date? <laughs> <laughs> the day arrived for me to get my admissions letter. Oh, I couldn't wait. My whole room was adorned with Michigan posters, the jacket, the hat, all of the paraphernalia. The moment that I had been waiting for, this would determine my destiny, and I was going to marry Michigan. Wait list. <laughs> How could I be on the wait list? I gave him almost dynamic essays, and it wasn't good enough for him. I even missed my Toastmasters meetings just to be with him. <laughs> I thought I was so in love, but I was only a fool in love. I'm sure many of you have dealt with this. We go into a relationship or a dream thinking that it's right for us and we get rejected. What happens when we're rejected? We close our hearts. And the next dream that comes, we stomp on it. The next man that comes, we hit them over the head. <laughs> <laughs> the next woman who tries to tell you that you are the next president of the world, you tell them, yeah, right, because your heart has been tarnished. Fellow Toastmasters and distinguished guests, I urge you to fall in love and not even care about rejection. Be who you were create, created to be no matter what happens. Fellow Toastmasters, I may have been a fool in love, but at least I gave my chance to fall in love. Would you want to go to your grave and realize that you never had the chance to fall in love?
timers. Please put one minute on the clock. Judges, mark your balance. Contestant number three, Cat Hennington, fail better. Fail better, Cat Hennington. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests, fail. Better? Failing hurts from grade school test traumas to disintegrating relationships, <laughs> from falling off a horse to missed flights to those rejection letters. <laughs> Failure has an excruciating mental cost. As with so many things in life, the best way to reduce that and increase your benefit from failure is practice. Practice failing, you ask? My first martial arts class, I spent two hours learning how to fall. <laughs> two hours falling forward, falling backward, falling on both sides. By the end of class, I was tired, sore, and I definitely felt silly. However, once you start learning more advanced skills, like sparring, or grappling, or manipulations, knowing how to fall properly helps you protect yourself. Practice makes these motions so natural that there is no thought involved. Can we make failure, the mental cost, so natural that there's no thought involved to trying again? You probably know a saying or two about failure and success. Most adages will tell you that failure is the path to success. But they only tell you that you have to try again, indefinitely. Finding 10,000 ways to make something not work is frustrating and tedious. Beating back that frustration to make yet another attempt can be a challenge all its own. This is where the practice comes in. What the practice builds is mental resilience. Mental resilience reduces the cost of each successive attempt so that eventually there's no cost at all to trying again. This also comes into play with a concept developed by Dr. Martin Seligman, flexible optimism. Flexible optimism encourages us to assess our abilities realistically. It encourages us to acknowledge our strengths and recognize our weaknesses. This helps us to find different paths to success. It helps us conserve our energies against over large endeavors. It encourages us to take a step back, realistically assess the situation. 
There are four ways that we can practice failure. Four steps that we can use to practice failing. Step one, find a safe environment where the risks of failure are high, but the consequences are low. <coughs> Step two, try something. Step three, fail. <laughs> Step four, repeat. <laughs> so if we're going to practice this, and we have these four key steps, we still have to admit that the cost of those first couple of attempts is going to be kind of high. How can we reduce that? Remember step one, our safe environment? Make it a game. We'll take a classic video game as an example. Super Mario Brothers. Step two becomes play. And if you're me, when you're playing, you jump over a drain pipe and get eaten by a giant piranha plant. <laughs> Whoops, that was just step three. Step four, I go back and try again. This time, I know that piranha plant's there. I'm not going to make that same mistake. I'll time my jump better. Get over it just fine. I just didn't realize there was a hole on the other side. <laughs> Whoops. I fell. It's okay. I know how to fall. <laughs> I go back and try again. This time, I know about the piranha plant. I know about that hole. But <sighs> there was that flying turtle shelled Koopa Troopa I totally didn't see coming. <laughs> Failing this way, it's still going to be a little frustrating. But it's fun, and it's funny, and that makes it that much easier to go back and start again. Eventually, I'll get past level one. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll get past level two, and world one, and world two. Now you're all looking at me incredulously. <laughs> Does playing a game really impact the rest of your life for the better? Playing a game, win or lose, helps develop flexible optimism and mental resilience. Playing a game, win or lose, helps develop flexible optimism and mental resilience. It's that much easier to get up and try again. Does learning how to fall in karate class impact any other aspect of your life for the better? It did mine. I fell off a horse. Because I knew how to fall properly, I was able to get right back up, get back on that horse, go around the arena a second time, much more aware of my balance, and able to keep my seat. Failing hurts. But there's a cure for that. Practice. Play a game. Make it a family and friends game night. And share your newfound flexible optimism and mental resilience. Fail better.
Contestant number four, Marlene Berger, Banquet of Sacrifice. Banquet of Sacrifice, Marlene Berger. One Saturday morning, I was organizing things around the house, including my father's World War II belongings. Showing them to my grandkids, who were seated next to me, I asked them, did you study about World War II in school? Have you read about its triumphs and sacrifices? One grandkid quickly said, no, not much. We don't even get textbooks. We get assignments. The other said, no, oh, Grandma, that's old. I was waiting for the, like you. <laughs> and I thought, oh, is it forgotten? Is it not relevant anymore? This got me thinking. September 20th, 2003, St. Louis, Missouri. I was at a banquet for the 84th annual reunion of the 3rd Infantry Division of the United States Army. I was a guest at the evening banquet at the Marriott. It was a banquet I will never forget. I wish you could have been there. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests, it wasn't what was on the table being served. It was who had served around the table. I happened to be sitting with three World War II veterans, living history, John, Norman, and Russell. John said to my right, the Battle of Anzio, January 22nd, 1944. Four months in a foxhole, rain, snow, even malaria. Hitler threw everything he had at the Americans so they wouldn't reach Rome and liberate Italy. They had bombs, they had shells coming at them on a daily basis, they had robots that were dropping, aimed to kill them. He lit up the sky for 24 hours a day so they couldn't sleep. Wanted to wear them down physically and break them. Wanted to break their morale mentally. He even dropped pamphlets that said things like, why are you here? Your friends are comfortable at home. Who's sleeping with your wife? Who's sleeping with your girlfriend? Go home. But they didn't quit. Many of them had nervous breakdowns, but they didn't quit, and they didn't make it to Italy. John was my father. I can tell you that he did suffer a nervousness from that battle that stayed with him for 66 years after the war. And after five years of combat, I could see him holding his head countless and countless times, trying to stop the memories, which he couldn't. It took all the hours, six months before he died, to wipe them out. Sacrifice, 66 years. Directly in front of me sat Norman. I could sit at that banquet and take my knife and fork, easily cut the meat, and raise it to my mouth. August 15th, 1944, on the beachhead, in France. It was dark at night he had volunteered for a battle patrol. Running into a primer cord with his rifle, it detonated. It tore his hands to shreds. There was no hospital there. Norman had to walk back to the beach. The only thing that saved his life was that they had swollen so much it stopped the bleeding. While I could easily eat, Norman ate like this. He took his hook, swooped up his mashed potatoes, and quickly brought them to his mouth so they wouldn't fall. 
Not only did he feel the hot mashed potatoes, he had an extra flavor, the cold steel of the hook. Then he stabbed the steak and brought it to his mouth and ripped it off with his teeth. 64 years after the war, sacrifice. Next to him sat his wife, Margaret. She married him after the war. She never felt the warmth of his hands. There weren't any. She only held the cold steel. And to my left was Norman. When I looked at him, I saw that he had a metal vine around his neck. Hill 616 from Kaisersburg, France. The Americans were trapped at the bottom of the hill, and Norman said, with three machine guns firing at them, the only way to go was up. He put on a white mattress cover, he put 12 hand grenades on himself, picked up the carbine, and went up the hill. Got to the first machine gun, they fired at him, got a 10 inch gash in his back, rolled back down the hill, he just climbed up, they threw a hand grenade at him, landed at his feet, and he kicked it. Went back up, and he eliminated all three machine gun nests. It wasn't easy. He was staggering, and he was bleeding. Sometimes he had to crawl, but he didn't give up. He had walked with a limp when he entered, and I realized that was the shrapnel that was left in his leg. 64 years of sacrifice. September 20, 2003, this banquet, what is it that I will never forget? This banquet was like a hot spoon of remembrance, stirred into a cold cup of forgetfulness. Sacrifice is always relevant. It's never outdated. This banquet was a life lesson that I would hold for the rest of my life upon my ears, in my mind, and written on my heart. It was a banquet of sacrifice. Mr. Tosmas. Madam Timers, please put one minute on the clock. Judges, mark your ballots. Our last contestant in the International Speech Contest, Steve Few. What God told Polly. What God told Polly, Steve Few. How many people have ever been asked tough questions by a little child? <laughs> Please raise your hands. Me too. November 7, 1996. I was in the hallway hanging up pictures when our youngest child, Polly, age six, came out of her room with her friend, Sticky. <laughs> Daddy, I have a question. Yes, Paul. Hi, Sticky. What's your question? Daddy, Sticky would like you to please put your hammer down and listen to my question. I'm sorry, honey. I'm listening. Daddy, how was God born? Oh, well, on Christmas Eve, you'll be playing an angel in the nativity pageant at church. No, Daddy, that's Jesus. I'm wondering about it. <laughs> Sorry, honey, I don't know. But, Daddy, you're my Daddy, and Daddy's know everything. Please, please, please tell me 
Daddy, I'm really, really wondering. Honey, daddies don't know everything. Maybe you could try asking God. <laughs> okay, Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> later, Polly came back. Her eyes were bright and she had a big smile on her face. Daddy, God told me how he was born. I'm listening. <laughs> God said that once upon a time there were sparkles. The little golden jewel sparkles made little circles of sparkles. The little circles made a big circle of sparkles. All the sparkles came together and made a rock. The rock started to follow its heart. It followed it into a magic chamber where there was a chair. The rock sat down on the chair and turned into God. But if you looked at the rock, you couldn't see God. But on the other side of the rock where you couldn't see, it was God. Wow. <laughs> Daddy, how were the sparkles born? <laughs> Daddy, I'll ask God tonight. <laughs> the next evening. Hey, Paul, want to ride through the car wash with me? Yay! Daddy, God told me how the sparkles were born. Let me pull over here. <laughs> God said that once upon a time there was a horn that didn't know how to beep. A long, long time went by, and then one day the horn went beep, and the sparkle flew out. <laughs> wow. Daddy, how was the horn born? <laughs> OK, Daddy, I'll ask God tonight. Can we go through the car wash now? <laughs> the next morning was Saturday. Hey, Paul, pancakes with many mouse ears. Coming, Daddy. Daddy, God told me about the horn. Oh, how was the horn born? God said the horn was never born. The horn was always there. God said he keeps trying and trying and trying to get people's attention, to get people to know he's here. God really, really, really wants people to be with him, and he wants to be with people. I was so amazed, I asked Polly to dictate her story to me, and I wrote it down on some notes. I put the notes in the kitchen drawer. Fourteen years later, Polly was off at college. Jackie and I were moving to smaller quarters, and I was back in the hallway taking the pictures down. And Jackie called from the kitchen. Stephen, come see what I found. Yes, dear. It was the notes. Today, Polly is all grown up. She works in human resources for a logistics company. I gave Polly a copy of the notes, but she had completely forgotten her childhood conversations with God. Maybe when she's old, like me, those memories will come back. Have you ever noticed something and then started to see it everywhere? I started seeing horns. <laughs> horns on trucks, horns in marching bands at halftime. At Thanksgiving, the horn of plenty, or cornucopia. It was broken off a divine goat by the infant god Zeus, future king of the Greek gods. Spills out unending food. The anniversary of God's creation of Adam and Eve, humanity, is celebrated by 100 blasts on the ram's horn, or shofar, at the Jewish New Year of Rosh Hashanah, also known as the Feast of Trumpets. I'll skip the other 99. <laughs> Three years later, in May 2013, the mail came with my issue of Discover Magazine, which I opened to this page, entitled, story of the universe. This is modern science's view of the evolution of the universe. The long axis is time, the wide axis is space. The scientists have discovered a lot. What they call the Big Bang. Sparkles. 
little circles of sparkles, big circles of sparkles, rocks, and the horn after it beat. But the scientists have not discovered the magic chamber. Does that mean there is no magic chamber, no chair, no God to answer a little girl's questions? I know what little Polly would have said had I asked her that back then. But Daddy, no! It wasn't a big bang. It was a big bee, <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> marking their ballots and please wait until the ballot counters have collected all of the ballots.
it could also have been a humorous contest combined. I think it was yeah. pretty nice. <laughs> At this time, I would like to call up all of the contestants, starting with the table topic contestants, and you can please line at, in the order that you appeared, first, second, third, and fourth down there, and then the international speakers, or speakers can line up to my, my left, right? <laughs> left, right. Left, right. Yeah, this is the worst hand, so this got to be the left. <laughs> And I know we had a contestant, a two contestants that actually participated in both contests. They would only give one prize. <laughs> All right, here. John, Michael, Steve, Jonathan, Amit, and Amy, right? Okay. Now, in essence of time, I'm going to make this really brief. So if you go too long, you're going to see someone with a hook. <laughs> okay. I would like to start with John. John, how you doing? Can you tell me what club you're from and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm from Morningstar Speakeasy, Ooh. right next to Daily Plaza. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been in Toastmasters for about nine years. Okay, John, and tell me one thing really quick. What do you like about Toastmasters? I love how you can learn how other people speak. It's amazing. Okay, and thank you so much. Like I said, we have a wonderful certificate of participation. And please grab one of those bags of candy off of there. Just one, because we have someone watching. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Same question. How long have you been at Toastmasters? I've been in Toastmasters two and a half months. And wow. what club? Two and a half months. Wow. And what club are you in? EPA 4501. All right. Let's go. I want to give you a trick question here. What do you like about Toastmasters? <laughs> Lily. <laughs> What I really like about it is I like self-improvement, and I like being around other people who try. Okay. Right. Well, thank you so much for participating in today's contest. Okay, Steve. So, Steven. You use Steve. Steven. Okay, that's the same. All right. Same question. What club are you in? I'm in two clubs. I'm here for successfully speaking, and I'm also in Loop Trustmasters. Yay. And how long, okay. how long have you been in Toastmasters? Three years in Loop Trustmasters, and about a month in successfully speaking. Okay, awesome, awesome. And a trick question. What do you like about Toastmasters? <laughs> I, I just love being with people who want to share their, open their hearts, share their life and experiences. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> we have from Frank Thomas, a.k.a. Oscar Langford. We present you with this certificate of appreciation. Thank you so much for participating. Okay. John, how long have you been in Toastmasters? I've been in Toastmasters for almost a year. A year? Okay. And what club are you in? Toast of the Loop. Toast of right. the Loop. Okay. Trick <laughs> question. What do you like about Toastmasters? <laughs> Um, I'd say what I like about Toastmasters is that I come in contact with people that I don't normally talk to and get near their stories. Awesome, awesome. Okay, we're going to hand you this certificate. Appreciation. <laughs> Big hurt day and give you an autograph after the day. <laughs> Amit, same question. Do I have to repeat it? I surely will. How long have you been? <laughs> I've been here almost a year and a half. Okay, and what club are you representing? Josh Rod Beyond Words. All right. Okay, next question. What do you like about Toastmasters? <laughs> All of this, and also knowing people, stories, when you will never hear those stories in the drawing room or in the bar. It's only over here that you hear those stories. Awesome. We're going to interview the international speech contestant. I know you probably warmed up for my questions. They're pretty tough, so just. Pay <laughs>
Asia, right? Asia. Asia. All right. Like the continent. Awesome, awesome. My name is Terry, like the Terry. <laughs> And what club do you represent? I represent the Paul Leaders Toastmasters Club, 669-822. Woo! What do you like about Toastmasters? I love the ability to be able to develop and enhance my professional and personal development and be able to speak about my nonprofit. Awesome. Awesome. That was so awesome. I'm not even going to say anything. I'm just going to hand you that certificate on behalf of Big Frank, a.k.a. Oscar Langford. Thank you so much. Go to d30toastmasters.org. There's also the Northeast. I don't know if Kathy's in the room or not. Hers is immediately yes. following that afternoon at 2.30 in Skokie. So there is some more contests coming up. Evanston, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. One, one. That's okay. She corrected it. Long as you don't know what end up in. Tim. First one will be at the AT&T University Center in Hoffman Estates. And yours, I think, is going to be at the Westminster Homes, yes. correct? In Evanston, Illinois. Right. You'll be able to find both of them at d30toastmasters.org. When you click on calendar, there'll be directions. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, anyone else? Yes. I'm a guest from, uh, with Christine. 
Uh, I am Miss Ill Miss Homewood Plus America, and I'll be in the contest this Saturday for Miss Illinois Plus America. Whoa, cool. <laughs> Watching you guys and seeing how you did your presentation, so I really enjoyed it. Thank you. That's what we do well. <laughs> because if we mess up, we do it again. Yeah. <laughs> Oscar is ready to announce the winners, so I'm going to call up our distinguished division <coughs> governor, Central South, Oscar Lanefer, aka Big Friend. this club. They have produced distinguished Toastmasters, division governors, area governors. They've been waiting for this trophy for a while, but I finally brought it. I'd like to bring up their president, Mr. James Hendricks, to accept it. Shonda Milton. <laughs> My name is James L. Hendricks. I'm president of Chicago Speakeasy. I'd also like to thank uh, Charlene Reinhardt for participating in our meeting. That's it. <laughs> the last club I'd like to recognize, or this is the second club, is BP Toastmasters of Chicago. And they've been instrumental in hosting our contest today. When I told Mark the idea we had about having a contest here, we kind of shared the same vision. We wanted to bring some more energy. This is a new club, and we wanted to have the contest here to show BP what Toastmasters is all about and just to help the club out. And Mark, I just want to thank you. And Lynette, I know I probably drove you crazy the last couple of weeks. Can I have Mark and Lynette come on up here? And
our behind the scenes person that does a lot with our ingenuity and creativity. Neither one of us are this creative, seriously. I, I don't know about Oscar, but in regards to my contest, I am not creative enough to think of all of the things that my Stephanie put into it. <laughs> Again, all the touches that you see with the baseball, come on, seriously. A caterer that serves peanuts and Cracker Jacks? Wow. <laughs> you don't get much better than that. <laughs> Stephanie worked with Lynette and Mark's team here at BP in order to really pull this off and stay true to the theme. And we really want to appreciate her. Could I have Ms. Ethel Goatee and Wilson Newport come on up and to announce the third place winner in the Table Topics contest. Third place, Central South Division Table Topic contest goes to Michael Carson. Bust the posy there. 
Yeah, yeah, post. Post. Okay. Stay. Well, you're <laughs> 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 Alrighty. Our first place winner representing Central South at the District 30 International Contest. Are you ready? Thank you. Thank you.